Let's begin, everybody. So, I'd like to start by wishing everyone a very, very warm welcome this evening to the Wiener Holocaust Library. It's my great honour and pleasure to be hosting tonight's event, which is very special for a number of reasons. Um, but one of those is in the room here with us tonight, the travelling exhibition Leave to Land, which will be showing at the Wiener Holocaust Library for the next four weeks. And we're delighted to be joined by uh, several speakers this evening, one of whom is the author and cr creator of the Leave to Land exhibition, Claire Weissenberg, who you can see is joining us via Zoom. Hello, Claire. <laughs> well, I'd like to start by absolutely congratulating Claire for, uh, for a number of things. First of all, of course, for uh, authoring this extraordinary sorry, exhibition. Don't know who you are. Don't know who you are. Oh, sorry, that's a very, very good intention. That was what I, was, <laughs> I was supposed to uh, say at the beginning, and that is it perfectly reminded me. Thank you. Um, my name is Toby Simpson, and I am the director of the Vino Holocaust Library. And that's where we are. This library, <laughs> for those of you who don't know it, is the world's oldest collection related to the Holocaust and it's Britain's largest. And the library is uh, privileged to hold Britain's largest collection of material relating to the Kitchener camp. Um, and some of the extraordinary items in the library's collections are on display here in this room, including the diary of Phineas May. Um, and you'll hear a great deal more about the history of the Kitchener camp this evening. And Claire uh, and others, uh, including our, our other speaker tonight, Anthony Lishak, are far, be far better positioned to tell you about that history than I am, so uh, I, I will leave that to them. But I did want to say how proud I am that the library will be hosting this exhibition, how important the history of the kitchen account is. Uh, for a long time, it was a forgotten history and was by no means as well remembered um, as other major rescues, especially the King's Transport. But it's thanks to the work of Claire uh, and Claire Anderson, who wrote the first serious book about the kitchen the camp, 4,000 Lives. Um, people like Anthony Lishak, who continues to research the history and raise awareness about it. Uh, they've helped to turn this history into a far better known history as it deserves to be. Um, the library's been involved with this um, for many years, and uh, we will continue to be, especially now that the, the Association of Jewish Refugees has incorporated the Kitchener Descendants Group as an official group within the AJR. So the library very much looks forward to many, many years of continuing to highlight this incredible history. So with that, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker this evening, Claire Weissenberg, the author of Leaf to Land. Claire. Hello. <laughs> I'm going to um, do a quick screen share with you because it's not hugely Fascinating to see watching uh, somebody while they're talking. If I can just find it on here. Um, unlike everybody else, I'm still getting used to Zoom after two years of the pandemic. There we go. Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. So, Hello and welcome to the launch of the Leaf to Land exhibition at its new home at the Wiener Holocaust Library in London. I'm so sorry I can't be there to view the exhibition with you. I'm going to be sharing your, my screen with you while I speak, showing you some of the images I was sent throughout the Kitchener Camp project. I don't have very long, so I've limited it to some of the photographs of Kitchener refugees and their families rather than trying to include the many varied ob objects, letters and documents that also came in. You'll get a sense from these how difficult my task was in selecting what to put in the exhibition that's around you. And also I hope some sense of the extent of what it was we achieved, despite having no experience putting anything like this together, uh, no historical expertise and no budget. Today is a proud day for all Kitchener families to finally see the launch of our Kitchener exhibition in such esteemed surroundings. Those of you who have family materials on the banners in the Kitchener Times magazine and in the digital exhibition will be especially proud today to know that our fathers' and grandfathers' histories are finally being more fully acknowledged. For many years, the history of Kitchener camp was little more than a footnote at best. 
And then Claire Angerson's wonderful book suddenly made much more of the history accessible to a much wider audience. For most Kitchen Her Families, her book, 4,000 Lives, was the first time we'd had the opportunity to read something that spoke to us about who we are and where we came from. With the Kitchener Project, from which you see images, we took this further, pushing our understanding of the Kitchener history to focus in on detail of the lives and trajectories of the individual men and some women refugees from Kitchener camp. Ours was not a history of important or wealthy people. Those who could get themselves out of Germany had largely already done so, or were helped by one of the many professional groups that assisted others like themselves. Ours was a history that had not really been told or understood, perhaps precisely because our fathers were not important people on the whole. They were doctors and dentists, laborers and artisans. They were musicians, artists, scientists, teachers. They were shopkeepers and traveling salesmen. They were fathers, they were husbands, and they were sons. They were ordinary people who found themselves forced to live through catastrophic times. It's been my fascination and my privilege to learn in company with other Kitchener families more about the times and experiences these men were forced to live through. We've gradually come to better understand the trauma they suffered and why they were as they were, as we knew them in our own lives, as fathers and grandfathers and all that entailed. The Kitchener Project brought Kitchener families together across widely dispersed geographical areas, cultures and across faith. And for many of us, I think it's fair to say, it was a bit like suddenly encountering long lost cousins, people who'd been through similar things to us, who had similar backstories, the same need to know and understand. One of my tasks this evening must be to thank some key people. My thanks first to Toby Simpson and Christine Schmidt and their staff at the Wiener Holocaust Library for giving the project and the exhibition their new home here in the heart of Bloomsbury just around the corner from Woburn House, in fact, where all our fathers and grandfathers will have gone for some piece of vital paperwork or another. As ever, my thanks to the Association of Jewish Refugees, where the Kitchener Descendants Group now has a new home. I believe Adam Daniels is here this evening. My direct thanks to you, Adam. Also to World Jewish Relief, whose predecessors funded and organized the Kitchener Camp Rescue. Without their help, most of us simply would not be here today because our fathers and grandfathers would never have made it out of Germany and Austria in 1939 without their assistance. And my thanks to the Kitchener Committee, Claire Angerson, Stephen Nelkin, Paul Secker and Adrienne Harris. Adrienne is the daughter of Phineas May, she's with you today, one of the two May brothers who took time from their own lives to run Kitchener Camp, which must have been an unbelievably stressful and difficult experience and to Robert May, the son of Jonas May, who was the Kitchener camp commander. Finally, in this section of what I want to say briefly, my love and my thanks to all our Kitchener families. You trusted me and the project with histories and experiences that are so personal and so traumatic in many cases, so much a part of who you are. I was and remain humbled and touched by that trust and by your warmth. Before I hand over to Anthony, he's going to tell you much more about the camp itself. I have a couple more personal things just up that I want to say. I miss our newfound Kitchener get togethers very much. I met many wonderful, lovely people doing this work who came to visit from all over the world. It was exhausting, but it was fulfilling like nothing else I've ever done before. And I was truly thrilled yesterday to see that USHMM, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, will honour a group including Kitchener refugees with their highest award. Uh, this group is the Ritchie Boys, who served in American military intelligence, working behind enemy lines against Nazism and at great danger to themselves. At least two Ritchie Boys were caught and executed as traitors when it was discovered that they were, in fact, German Jews. You can read a little about the Ritchie Boys in the digital section of tonight's exhibition nine of whom were Kitchener camp refugees before transmigrating onwards to North America. 
Throughout the months and years that we've been doing this work, I've noticed that even with our common background, everyone brings to this their own knowledge set, their own experience of the joys and traumas of Kitchener family lives, and of course, their own character. And I'm sorry to say that at least one character is missing from the room this evening. At the end of these two long years, since we were first due to launch this exhibition in 2020, this man would have been in the room with you. He would have had a huge hug for anyone and everyone. His father was from Upper Silesia, like my dad, and we've been going to work together to find out more about their place of origin. But larger than life, Sam Costa isn't with us today for work or for hugs. He went on holiday with his lovely wife, Louise, in autumn 2020. They both caught this wretched COVID virus, and although Louise thankfully made it through, Sam did not. Sam's father and mother were married at Margate Synagogue in August 1939. Theirs was one of a number of Kitchener weddings. The photograph of Ugin and Lottie under the canopy is on exhibition banner number seven, Jewish Life, as is the testimony about their wedding as told by Sam's mother. If you look at nothing else in any depth this evening, busy as your no doubt will be, please do take a few minutes to look at the photograph of Sam's parents' wedding and to read his mother's testimony. Sam was rightly so very proud that his family materials were in this exhibition. And I know it would mean a lot to his family if you please take a moment to acknowledge them and to remember Sam, may his memory be a blessing. In closing this section, as ever, I dedicate my work and this exhibition to my Kitchener refugee father, Werner Weissenberg, and to my grandparents, Elsa and Leopold, who were not rescued, and who, like so many members of your own extended families, were killed in the Shoah. Thank you again so much for joining us this evening for the launch of the exhibition Leave to Land, the Kitchener Cab Rescue 1939 at the Wiener Holocaust Library in London. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, I absolutely second that recommendation to look at the panel on Jewish life. I, was, I had the privilege of, of reading the exhibition again today, and it really was that panel that struck me, and the, the images from Margate Synagogue with the wedding so, are just wonderful. So before we, uh, I introduce Anthony Lishak, I do have to say, first of all, thank you so much, Claire, for joining us this evening. Um, what you said is really testament to the global reach of what we've done, what you've done with this story, what, what uh, has been achieved with awareness of the Kitchener Camp Rescue. I'm sure there are people zooming in uh, tonight from all over the world, uh, from the United States. And uh, because of the power of hybrid technology, um, we are going to have to do a bit of a switch over now, which means I'm going to turn the television off. To the people in the room, it might look a bit like you're going, Claire, but actually you are still going to be zooming in. It's just you'll be seeing us from that camera. So I think we're all going to say a very fond farewell to Claire <laughs> as I switch off the TV. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay, to continue with our programme this evening, it's my pleasure to now be able to introduce Anthony Lissac, our main speaker, who will be uh, talk, uh, talking about the history of the Kitchener camp. Anthony is the chief executive of uh, Learning from the Righteous, which is a Holocaust education charity, and he's going to be using his time this evening to explore the significance of the remarkable uh, humanitarian act that was the creation of the Kitchener camp. So please join me in welcoming Anthony Lissac. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Toby. Actually, the whole this talk starts with lots of thank yous. Um, 
I, I, I put this screen up because I've got loads of people to thank. You've already heard from Claire, without whom we won't be here. The only person actually who's not in the room is Claire Anderson, but she is here in her book. And if you've not read it, please do, because I think we all agree without Claire, we wouldn't be here as well. So thank you, thank you. Um, Stephen Nelkin had no idea his picture was going to be up there. Also features later on in this talk, poor guy. Lots of thanks. Um, also, thank you to these two people. These two people are um, Phineas May and Jonas May. There's a reason I put their middle names as well, because their initials together gave them their sort of affectionate um, nickname, Plum Jam. They were known. I have no idea the name of the bird in the middle. Uh, but, um, but we do know that this picture was taken um, on the Jewish Lads Brigade camp, okay? Jewish Lads Brigade were deeply involved in the whole project. Um, and, and, and this picture actually is also a, a confirmation of that. Um, can you see that um, tent over there? Um, that was the synagogue, and that tent was also um, donated by the Jewish Lads Brigade. So thanks to the Jewish Lads Brigade. Um, now, uh, it, Claire's mentioned, and actually um, in the cabinet at the far end over there, we've got examples of this man's, please work, computer, fantastic diary. This is Phineas, and Phineas, thank God, kept, he was um, an obsessive diary keeper. I hear actually from his, his daughter and son-in-law that he actually kept diaries every day almost after Kitchener Camp as well. But we have got his Kitchener Camp um, diary in the uh, museum and in, 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 in the Vena Library, sorry. And that's there because that's paper taken from the Bell Hotel. Because um, the Bell Hotel in Sandwich was where um, the people who set up the camp stayed and the beginning of the his diary is actually written on the back of paper taken from the bell hotel and, and this just gives you a feel of what it's like it's it's loads and those fantastic writes loads of little drawings it's a it's a absolute treasure trove so thank you phineas thank you um uh adrian now i don't intend to give a highly detailed um, at, uh, account of what the camp was. My hope this evening is to link Kitchener Camp with broader Holocaust narratives. You'll see that even though it's often referred to as a footnote, it's connected deeply with lots of sort of wider Holocaust narratives. But I'm going to give you a, a little grounding in what the camp was. Um, as, 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 as you know, the Jewish emigration from Germany started as soon as the Nazis came to power in 33, firstly by those who had the means and connections to do so. In Britain, a cohort of Jewish activists led by Otto Schiff, whose blue AJR plaque is just three minutes down the road on the on, on Woven House, um, they coordinated help for these refugees, forming the central fund for German Jewry, which is the forerunner of today's world Jewish relief. This assistance gradually increased throughout the 30s and rapidly expanded in 1938, firstly after the Anschluss and, in, in, and later on, of course, after the November pogrom. It was lobbying from the CBF and other voluntary agencies that finally persuaded the government to ease its entry requirements enabling this network of Jewish activists to set up the kinder transport and then the Kitchener camp scheme. And I say, it's my aim to link this story with broader Holocaust narratives, but look, you may be interested, this actually, this, this map appears um, on, the, uh, on one of these panels. It's a hand-drawn map of the area. Actually, I think it was done by railway enthusiasts because there's loads of railway lines in there. Um, of, of, of what Kitchener Camp was just after 1918. That over there is where the um, army camps were, where, where, where soldiers were being trained. And actually, it was a prisoner of war camp as well. Uh, th there is reports 
of um, scribbles on the walls written by prisoners, um, in interestingly. Um, so, and that's basically where it is. If, I'm sure many of you know, but if you don't, that's where it is geographically. Now, I'm going to introduce you to another individual, Ernest Joseph, who was also um, a Jewish Las Brigade person, hugely important, an architect who, who was really the brains behind the structure of the camp. And I'm going to read you something he wrote. It, this, is, this is all in the Vena archive, which will give you an idea of what um, Ernest Joseph and also the May brothers confronted when they turned up at Sandwich. When the first inspection was made, snow was deep on the ground, and the only inhabitant of the huts was a fox, which appeared to find shelter within even these cheerless walls. The land around was marshy and ill-drained, there was no electrical wiring, the water supply was inadequate, and there was no facilities for cooking or heating. In fact, in these early days, the idea of establishing a complete town, for that is what it is, to 3,500 people almost seemed ridiculous. Okay, so you've got some concept of the physical demands of turning what was basically a derelict site into something that three and a half to 4,000 people actually lived in. It's an amazing physical um, achievement. But before I move on to some of the links I'm gonna talk to you about, I wanna show you a photograph that I discovered in the archive in one of the many photograph albums, which will give you an idea of the logistical um, uh, challenges that the May brothers had to Confront. So that is, don't worry, I'm just going to get clearer in a minute so you can go and read it. That is a photograph of the chart that was on Jonas May's wall, director of the camp. Okay. There are, don't worry, you'll see it a lot clearer in a minute. There are nearly 90 different departments he was organizing. And I picked out a few for you. There was the camp university. Is that clear enough? Can you read that? There was the camp university. There was a library. There was the overseas settled settlement department. There was a rat catchers department. There was the post office. There were potato peelers. This was a logistical, you can see how he was used to running Jewish last brigade camps, can't you? There was vocational guiding, um, dental surgeons, goldsmiths, Shoemakers, hairdressers, bookbinders, linoleum workers, and bricklayers. I just put it up there so you can like, they, it wasn't just turning up and setting something up. It was almost six or seven months of complete devotion and dedication. They lived there, they gave their lives to this scheme. I think that speaks about it as well. Let me share you before. This is actually one of my favorite photographs. I love it. I don't know if you can see, there's a, is there a beam on this? That, can you see that um, white post sort of a quarter way across? It says car park. <laughs> Hilarious, okay. Okay, let's move on a bit. So I'm now gonna talk to you about some of the other Holocaust narratives that Kitchener Camp is linked to, okay? I'm gonna start with Oswald, Mosley and the British Union of Fascists, because there was a BUF cell in Sandwich at the time, okay? It's recorded in um, Phineas's diary. Um, I will read you what he said. Oh, is, is that better? You see me now, okay. It says this, one shot, close to the hotel, I'm sure we'll reap a rich harvest from the camp. One of Oswald Mosley's black shirt shops, even in the remote village like Sandwich, they have headquarters. I hope our 3,500 will keep them well occupied. That shows you some of Phyllis's um, sense of humor. This actually is the shop now. It's not owned by the British Union fascists, but um, that's the shop as it is. Later on, on the 9th of February, 1939, Phineas wrote in his diary recording um, a sort of gathering at the local chamber of commerce. 
and Jonas gave a speech, okay, at, at the local Chamber of Commerce, the local businessman. Phineas wrote this. Jan, that's his brother, spoke extremely well. It was amusing. Lady Pearson, who is such a supporter of the black shirts and even pays for the small shop for promoting fascism in the town, was the first speaker. Jay was the last. It clearly amused Phineas to know that um, this Jew was following um, someone who was an ardent fascist in the town. And written um, later on in the diary is this. It says, in Sandwich today, I'm informed that the fascists have put up notices. A German is worth two Englishmen, a very subtly worded notice. I'm telling you this because there was a fascist cell in Sandwich and on the whole, there was no animosity at all towards the 3,500 Jews living down the road. In fact, one of the, one of the themes of this story is one of acceptance and tolerance, and which is why I much prefer the next quote I'm going to give you. It's from Lothar Nelkin, hi Steve, and actually and, and, and Lothar's um, diary, which is fantastic, is quoted on, on, on Claire's exhibition. I'm just going to share you a quote from his diary, which is far more indicative of what it was like to be a, re a refugee in Sandwich. Um, in the evening, after dinner, another trip to Sandwich with two others. We go to the pub. I order my first English beer. It costs a small fortune. Things haven't changed, have they? And tastes different from German beer, but good. We had hardly sat down at a table when another Englishman sent us another round. To me, that epitomizes that, 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 that seeps through Phineas's diary and most of the accounts of the time. Okay. Let's move on to another connection. Lord Winterton, the teacher in me wants to say, hands up if you know who Lord Winterton is. You're so well behaved. <laughs> Lord Winterton was the head of the British dele uh, delegation at the Evian conference in July 38 in Evian. Um, there was a conference that was called to discuss the growing problem of Jewish refugees in Europe. It was a complete failure, of course, but it took place. Here, here is um, Winterton with the American and French heads, and, and this is um, Winterton who's giving a speech at the conference. Before the conference took place, it was already agreed that no extra quotas would be um, taken by governments to let in more Jews, and also no government would be asked to find any funds. It was purely a talking shop. The only outcome, really, was the setting up of the Intergovernmental Committee for Refugees that Winterton headed. There are two direct connections that Winterton has with the camp. Firstly, we know that he was one of the members of the government that was involved in the discussions at the end of 1939 that eventually allowed the visa requirements to be relaxed, that allowed the kinder transport and Kitchener camp to take place. That's one link. But there is a direct physical link. Thank you, Vina Library's archive, because in the um, visitor's book, we have Winterton signing, because he turned up, fifth, the, the uh, 2nd of May, 1939, he turns up, and if you look down the right-hand side, he's with lots of very important people. For me, the most important one is the colonial office person. You'll see why in a minute when I read you the quote. Um, but before I do, um, I want to show you this, because this is in Phyllis's diary, because this is a high-level um, big, big, big bugs, I think he quoted them, um, uh, visit, and he actually puts a map in his diary as where he was sitting, how close he was to Lord Winterton, uh, sitting next to Sir Robert Whaley Cohen, who was a, also a hugely important person in the setting up of the camp. I'm now going to read you the report of um, this visit that was written in, that appeared in the monthly Kitchener Camp Review. Okay, I'm going to try and put on what I think Lord Winterton's voice is. Here, this is his speech. For myself, what has pleased me most in seeing this camp is the keenness and skill and interest of you all. I think that what we have seen has 
removed any doubts we may have had that you're making good when the time comes for you to emigrate to Australia, South Africa, America, Br British Guyana, or any other British possession in which you may be able to find an opening. I think it's revealing that it refers to America as a British possession in 1939, but we'll move on for that. And later on, he says, we all sincerely hope that it may be as soon as possible for you, find, for you to find a permanent home, not in this country. Direct quote, okay. But, but actually, but there is another link. There's a lovely link, thank you, Phineas, um, that Winston has with the camp, because two days later, he writes this in the diary. Don't worry, I, you don't have to read it. I've got it written here. This is, Phine this is what Phineas wrote two days later. A letter marked confidential addressed to me was from Lord Winterton, expressing his appreciation of his visit to the camp. He had seen my name in the camp magazine. I suppose he thought I was the director. In fact, it was his brother. Anyhow, he enclosed two pounds. One pound is an annual subscription for the Kitchener Camp Review and the other to purchase seeds for the gardens round the mess huts. So we know that Lord Winterton did contribute to the refugee uh, crisis. He paid for the seeds at Kitchener Camp. I'm going to give you another link now. Um, who knows? Hands up if you think you know Benjamin Mermelstein. Uh, two points, Toby. He's, he is actually he's a hugely significant figure in the broader Holocaust context. He was the surviving elder of the Judenrat in Theresienstadt. I'm telling you this, this is years after Kitchener Cat. He was a hugely controversial figure, as many members of the Judenrat were, because they were negotiating with the Nazis or being used by the Nazis. To use whatever term you wish. We do know that Mervistein was involved in organizing the logistics of some of those propaganda films that were sent from Theresa He survived. Someone once said to me he had the curse of surviving because he survived and became this figure of vitriol after the war. This is a book he wrote that actually translates as um, a Theresienstadt, the flagship ghetto. Um, he tried to um, sort of re reignite his standing in the community, but look, there are photographs of him collaborating. It's very difficult to, to, to talk very simply about the role of someone like Mermelstein. Actually, if you want to know more, you can find his um, archive. It's actually here. I don't, I, I, I've not seen it, Toby, but it, it, from here, it's actually huge. It must be really fascinating to read. Why am I telling you this? Let's go back a few years. Austria, you're talking 1938 Austria. This is Eichmann, um, who after the Anschluss was doing all he can to get Jews out of Austria. At a huge cost to Jews, of course, he was doing all he could to organize things on the ground. And one of the things he did was gather local Austrians, local members of the Jewish community. They were often called Achman's men. I don't know if you ever heard them being described as Achman's men, but there was a group of them who met with him regularly. Um, and Achman was putting pressure on them to get Jews to leave Austria. And of course, Mermelstein was one of them. Okay. We know a little bit more about Mermelstein. Why? Because he was interviewed by Claude Landsman for Shoah. For, for very complex reasons, um, his film was never used. It was used later on for another film about Mermelstein. But I've got extracts of his interview here. So I'm going to play it for you. It, hopefully the sound works. I've put some subtitles on because my German is that brilliant. Um, so here we go. Let's hope you can... Hear what he says. The Aushandlung is in the 39 in Frühjahr and in Sommer very zufriedenstellend gegangen. It is gelungen mit Hilfe der von mir geleiteten Aktion Camp Richboro das Problem der KZ-Leute. Das waren jene Leute, die nur auf Aushandlung in Grimmen und Konzentrationslager gekommen sind. 
Und, aber das heißt, da hat sie dann herausgelassen, nur obwohl der, die Versicherung, dass sie sofort weggehen. Es ging täglich fast Sonderwagen ab mit Kindern, mit Frauen im Rahmen der Hausgerichtenaktion. Meine Unterschrift war nämlich legalisiert beim Home Office in London und aufgrund meiner Unterschrift auf ein Permitformular, das mir anvertraut war, konnte der Konsul das Visum geben. Nur aufgrund eines Permits. Das Permit hat schließlich den Stempel des Home Office gehabt. Ich gebe meine Unterschrift dazu. Siehe da, die Holländer und die Belgier haben sie durchgelassen. Die Engländer haben sie reingelassen und alle Permit-Formulare sind ausgenutzt worden, bis auf den letzten Rest. A hugely complex, fascinating character. And it was only two weeks ago that I found this photograph that was taken of him when he visited Kitchener Camp on the 25th of April, 1939. He turns up. He turns up. Is mobbed, of course, because as far as the uh, Viennese Jews are concerned, he is there, there, there rather, because of him. Mr. Mermelstein, who is a man who has been responsible for getting so many men over from Austria, compared with the small number who have come from Germany, flew over and arrived at this camp today. He received a wonderful reception from the large number who he had helped to bring here. That's from Phineas's diary. This is the caricature that was drawn of him. I don't think of Phineas, I think, but by the time this came out, there were quite a few AF, was the initials of the uh, cartoon that disappeared in the camp review, but I want to, and, and his whole speech is quoted there, I want to read you a part of Mermelstein's speech, which I think epitomizes how complex this person was. But may, bear in mind, this is published in the Kitchener Camp Review. One question, he says, has been repeated in almost every talk I had with members of the camp, whether it would be possible to enable friends who were still living in Vienna to emigrate from there. There is only one answer to the above question. It depends on a great number of conditions of which the good behavior, your good behavior, and the good work of those who are already here is not the least one. I think someone who's been negotiating with Eichmann and knows the nuances of what's going on would know that the way that Jews behave in Kent isn't going to really affect it's, it's, it gives me the impression of someone who's happy to say what seems appropriate at the time, which is probably what you need to live the life that he lived. There, uh, I, the three-hour film, thank you, Claude Landsman, that eventually made of uh, this man's life, he often refers to what he did as an adventure. But, he, but his actions were responsible as well for many Jewish lives, Welcome to the complexity of this subject. I want to show you one more thing before I move from Mendel, uh, from Mermelstein, because this is a hugely important man called Julian Leighton, who was part of the Jewish activists. He, uh, he was a German-born Jew, but he was a British subject who traveled all over Europe, doing what he could to organize the operation from the European side. Okay, and he was, he, he was loosely, he was one of, um, Eichmann's men. We know that Eichmann treated him rather different from the Germans. Actually, there is a record of Eichmann ringing Julian Leighton, who was in Vienna just before Kristallnacht, telling him not to come because there's going to be something happening. So, I mean, that's all to totally happened. So that shows the type of various relationships that Eichmann was developing. Okay, and, and, I, I, and this is a picture of um, Leighton S uh, sitting next to Jonas at a meeting that took place later on that year at the camp. I want to show you one more um, image that comes from the archive here, which actually speaks to s the emotional reactions of the people who were in Kitchener camp. It's, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try and read it to you. I don't know if I see it clearly. It's, it, it, it's, it's addressed to um, 
to, jo to Julian Layton from one of the Kitchener men who was leaving Kitchener camp sort of in May 1940 when the camp um, was being disbanded. And it says, in this moment where we are to leave Kitchener camp, we both should like to express just our feelings of gratitude and tender homage for your kindness and all the, all the, uh, and the multitude endeavors that facilitated our living. Okay, and there's a, there are a lot of really heartfelt messages which make you that, that, that draw into the emotional trauma that these men were going through. Okay, one more connection. Dobercourt. Um, many of you will know that at Dobercourt there was um, a Butlins holiday camp where many of the kinder transport were put. Um, actually, um, if that's for me, tell them I'm busy. Um, and but Dovercourt plays a huge part in Kitchener Camp's history. It's it's right to say, I think it's right to say, the Kitchener Camp and the Kinder Transport were sister schemes, two sides of the same coin, if you like, organised by the same activists and benefiting from the same concessions on conditions of entry made by the government. But the archives here reveal the closer link, a closer link, okay. Um, because Jonas May actually was on, had visited Dover Court way before Kitchener Camp was even an issue. There is a handwritten manuscript in the archive upstairs that Robert and I have been talking about um, uh, in the last few weeks, I printed it all out. I will read you a part of it, okay? Bear in mind, this is Jonas May with um, so, um, other members of the CBF visiting Dover Court even before anyone knew what Kitchener Cat was. And, and what I'm going to read you um, was what he wrote. It says, that December was the iciest I could remember, and the journey was slow and treacherous, but we got there. What did we see? Scores of boys and girls, all young, with some very young. Children separated from their parents, either permanently because their parents had already been murdered by the Nazis, or temporarily, one hoped, because of, the, it, because of internment or harassment. Little ones crying, not fully understanding what was happening to them, nor why. Still not recovered from the nightmare journey out of their native land, where all was harsh and cruel. To Dover Court, where strangers seemed bent on trying to make them happy and forgetful of the fact. Little children who could hardly have been accused anything much more of being, well, just little children. As some of the older boys were to meet with us later in this saga at the camp, it, it's well now to digest their background and wonder how so many remain so nice for so long. So, and it was, and, 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 and Jonas says that when eventually he got the phone call to say, are you interested in coming to Kitchener Camp? He said, yes, because of the experience of going to Dover Court a, a couple of months earlier. And I'm going to carry on the connection uh, of Kitchener Camp and Dover Court with this person's testimony. Um, Peter Mansbacher, or as he was when he came over, um, Fritz, okay, who was at Dover Court, but eventually he's one of the Dover Court boys that went across from Dover Court to Kitchener to help set it up. Here's a leave the land sticker to go to Harwich that he had, and this is um, his documents. After supper that evening, there were many discussions about the pros and cons of helping out Lord Kitchener Camp. What could we expect there? What might the condition be there? What kind of people would be working there? What happens if they find a foster family for us in the, in the meantime? And what would our chances be when that project would be completed. 
Would we come back to Dover Court Camp and wait for families? Would there still be a Dover Court Camp? This boy was 17. This is a 17-year-old anxious child. And then, would it not be hard labor? After all, the gentlemen who came to visit us stressed that they were looking for strong and physically fit men to do the work. But finally, the idea of helping others won out over all other considerations. We hope to continue our efforts on our parents' behalf from the camp and felt that the Committee for Refugee Children would not abandon us. And after the first night at Kitchener Camp, when they journeyed across, he says, at six, at six o'clock in the morning, Mr. Phineas, one member of the camp staff, came to the hunt with a large gong, which startled us out of a good sleep. We jumped into our overalls and wellingtons and walked over to the dining room. The breakfast was not much, but the porridge was filling. We all knew why we had come here, and we were very anxious that the work proceeded as quickly as possible. The faster we worked, the quicker the huts would be ready, and the sooner hundreds and maybe thousands of men could get out of the concentration camps in Germany. And later on, we really felt that we had won the fight against odds when the first busloads of men from Germany and Austria arrived at our camp. We watched silently as they left the buses and were ushered into the camp office for registration and assigned their, ha their hut numbers. Having been instrumental in their arrival made us feel warm inside. There were some shouts of joy as some of the volunteers recognized former friends among the new arrivals. That is a theme that runs through Phineas's diary, coincidences of people meeting. And there was one example actually of someone coming over, seeing his brother, but having to leave the next day to go to Australia. It's an amazing, but very complex history. This, let me read you from Phineas's diary. The coach to take them away, because they had to eventually leave, arrived at 10 a.m. And before they left, the mayor of Sandwich got in the coach and said a few words of farewell. There were wet eyes in the coach. There is no doubt they have been happy here. I went with them as far as Canterbury. They're going to be in Wallington Farm training from now on. I feel we shall hear more about these excellent boys in the future. He knew what he was talking about. I'm going to show you just one more link, which I think is hugely important. And then um, I'll have a chance to look in more detail at the, uh, at the uh, exhibition. Now, when war was declared, suddenly these um, refugees became enemy aliens. There were two stages to this. Internment started after the fall of France in May 1940. We're talking 1939, the fall of war, home office tribunals all over the country, having discussions, interviews rather, with refugees to assess whether they were friendly or enemy aliens, okay? This document is in the Vena archive upstairs. Let me explain it to you. It is a check sheet of all the um, interviews that took place on those days over there. Um, th those names at the top of, are the six judges that came to interview them. 2,972 2, people were interviewed in that day. And actually, bottom left-hand corner, can you see George Layton's name? Heavily involved. Okay. This is significant. I'll tell you why it's significant. And actually, if you've read Claire's book, you'll know because she puts this at the very end of her book. These six judges or barristers were so moved by what they heard they wrote a collective letter to the Times that appeared on the front page of the Times on the 1st of November. The Times, if you know, was quite an appeasement um, newspaper. So the fact that this appeared, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to read it, I'm going to read bits out, um, appeared. I'm going to give you some extracts here. This was read across the land, and, it's, and it undermines the uh, belief that maybe people here didn't know what was going on. 1st of November, 1939. Sir, 
We, the undersigned, were appointed to the Home Office to act as tribunals at Richborough Camp in Kent to consider the cases of some 3,600 aliens whose status was charged by the declaration of war from that of refugee to enemy alien. They're all Jews by race and have Jewish blood in their veins. The witnesses told their stories with obvious reluctance. They were afraid in the event of identification of reprisals that might follow against their relatives still in Germany. Further, before leaving a concentration camp, each man was warned against ever saying what he had suffered or seen and was told, we have spies everywhere. We heard of cases where the arrest of a father in a few days by the note, sorry, the, the arrest of a father was followed in a few days by the notification that he was ill in prison and in a concentration camp, the locality of which was not specified. A report followed later that he had died in due course a box purporting to contain his remains was brought to the house with a demand for 500 marks, the expense of cremation. Read over the dinner tables in England on the 1st of November 1939. I just wanted to make that clear. One man stated that at a particular camp, he was thrown down, beaten, and stoned. His right leg and three ribs were broken, and after his leg had been set, he was forced to walk with the with the leg in splints. Others told of an old man of 80 who had both legs broken and then died. Another was told by a guard to strike with a spade, a friend of his who had formerly been a judge. In his judicial capacity, the latter had sentenced two Nazis to death for a criminal offence. The witness refused to do so. He was immediately bayoneted in the arm and had to remain in hospital soon after the judge died in the camp. Men were put to death in circumstances so horrible as to be almost unbelievable. Evidence was given before one of the tribunals of a specific case where a man was being taken into an empty room between two black shirts. His cries for mercy were heard by men in the passage and in the adjoining room. Later, he was found hanging from a beam. It was officially reported that he had committed suicide. We find it hard, the article concludes, to believe that a government which permitted the treatment to which we have referred or those who inflicted it and any longer claim to be civilized. And those are the names that appeared at the bottom of the article and those are their names that are actually in the visitor's book at Kitchen the Camp. One of the, I don't know if the word is joys, I'll use the word Joyce, of studying this subject is discovering things that you couldn't imagine. And, and la there's layer upon layer upon meaning, which makes this story for me hugely contemporarily relevant as well as historically significant. Um, Toby, I've, I have got five or six more minutes. Are we happy with five or six more minutes? Or, uh, yeah, five, five minutes at most. I just wanted to show you one really geeky bit of thing I discovered, okay? There aren't many traces, in fact, no real traces of Kitchen the Camp left. There are huts in the area, but I've been there with Claire Angerson. We're not sure whether or not they're old ones that are renovated. It's very difficult to tell. Do you recognize that map? Thanks to Google Map, we can show you exactly where it is. Okay, there we are. Okay, and can you, uh, that area there, yes? Let me highlight it. It's Pfizer's HQ. And so in Pfizer's HQ, that is the only footprint we have of Kitchen the Camp is in the car park of Pfizer's um, uh, HQ. Isn't that remarkable? And, and on the Holocaust Memorial Day this year, a tree was dedicated there. Um, last question. Which one of you thinks is the, is the representative from the AJR? Which is which, what do you think? Because you, you're wrong. The one on the right is the director of the um, of the industrial park and the one on the left is a representative of AJR. I promise you that's something I found out yesterday. I've left a message with his PA. I can't wait to talk to him. Okay. It's been a real pleasure to share some of my research with you. I just want to point out that there's a film, a very short film that I have made about Kitchen the Camp. If you search Remembering Kitchen the Camp on YouTube, it will come up. 
many of you I think will have seen it. And I want to point out one more thing on Yom HaShoah this year. Don't worry, I'm sure you'll be receiving information about this in your inbox in the next few weeks. Yom HaShoah, we are organizing a concert at Wigmore Hall, where some of this story is going to be told along with music and three British Holocaust Heroes medals being presented by the government to these marvelous men. There's a reason why the concert's taking place. And actually, actually, as a good teacher, I'm not going to tell you why. If you find any, because um, I've seen your marvelous display here, one of the um, display cabinets has correspondence between Phineas May and the BBC. Okay. What was proposed in these letters didn't happen. We hope to restage it here. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. So much, actually. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I just want to ask you all to take some time at the end. Of the evening. I'm just going to go right. Sorry, still getting used to this uh, hybrid environment. Um, so I'd just like to invite you all to spend a bit of time at the end of the evening, enjoying some refreshments, viewing the exhibition. It's a pleasure to have you here. I want to just also conclude by saying a huge thank you to our speakers this evening, Claire Weissenberg, <coughs> Anthony Lishak, and everyone else. Uh, I'm sure many people in this room who've contributed to this collective effort to raise the profile and remember the Kitchener camp. Toby, I did forget to mention we have someone in this room who's actually on the camp. Oh, really? So, yeah. Should we ask them, that person to stand up? Danny, or? Danny, stand up. Da Danny and I have done many joint events in school. Um, <laughs> and and, and um, he was four. <laughs> <laughs> and he's come all the way down from Manchester with his marvelous wife. Right, this is a real, a real pleasure that you're here. What a special evening, and uh, thank you all for joining us for it.